Hi, I'm Dr. Marge Charmley. I'm a licensed psychologist and the chair of the Marriage Equality Task Force for the Minnesota Psychological Association. I'm also the producer and co-host of By Cities, a cable television program which serves to educate people about the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender communities. Hello, I'm Dr. Anita Kozan. I'm a speech and language pathologist, and I'm licensed both in healthcare and in education. One of my specialties is providing services of voice and speech help for persons who are transgendered, both women and men. I have also worked as an advisor in the St. Paul Public Schools for an organization that is called the Gay Straight Alliance. Along with Dr. Charmley, I uh, am the co-producer and the co-host of By Cities. In November of 2012, Minnesotans will be asked to go to the polls to vote on a constitutional amendment which would define and limit marriage as being between one man and one woman. It's already illegal in the state of Minnesota for same-sex couples to marry. If this constitutional amendment passes, it would make it very difficult to overturn such discriminatory legislation. The Minnesota Psychological Association has passed resolutions which both oppose this constitutional amendment and support marriage equality. As part of those resolutions, the Minnesota Psychological Association is dedicated to informing the public about the psychological harm created by anti-gay initiatives as well as the psychological benefits of marriage equality. We at By Cities are proud to collaborate with the Minnesota Psychological Association in these educational endeavors. Today we are going to discuss the large and substantial body of knowledge of scientific findings on which the American as well as the Minnesota Psychological Associations have based a very important decision, a decision to support marriage equality for all people, regardless of their sexual orientation. Well, Marge, as a psychologist, you must be very proud of the accomplishments of your professional association. Well, Anita, it's true I am. And in, in, in this respect, on this issue, the psychological is the political is the personal. And so I'm delighted that we have this large and substantial body of scientific research that can help inform the public debate on this. And I might say that, you know, there are a number of people that have wondered, including members of our own uh, psychological association, why the American Psychological Association and the Minnesota Psychological Association have entered the public debate on marriage equality. And what I'd like to say to that is long before this became a public debate, mm -hmm. psychologists have been studying issues to better understand. They've been conducting scientific research to better understand things like beliefs, attitudes, discrimination, stereotypes, prejudices, sexual orientation, gender identity, families, marriage, relationships. So those are all topics that are apropos to this discussion. And we have had answers and we have an information about that. I think that make us uniquely qualified and well suited to inform the public debate on this issue. Well, let's, let's uh, look at some of the answers to the questions that have been posed, especially those questions that are likely to come into focus as part of the marriage amendment debate. Now, this may seem pretty obvious to us, but there are still people out there who really ask the question, are gay, lesbian, and bisexual people normal? What, uh, what do the, the data that the uh, psychological research has come up with, what, what, do, what do psychologists say about this? Well, let me just say that for most of the 20th century, both psychologists and psychiatrists did view homosexuality and bisexuality as psychological disorders. And it wasn't until the late 1950s that people began to do research to actually study, is there something, is this a psychological disorder? 
And after a substantial amount of research was accumulated on those questions, the American Psychiatric Association and the American Psychological Association reversed their positions on that. So in 1973, the American Psychiatric Association removed homosexuality and bisexuality as a psychological disorder. In 1974, the American Psychological Association followed suit. So that's the science behind that. Now in more recent um, years, some of uh, what's, there have been debates about whether or not uh, re reparative therapy works. And reparative mm -hmm. therapy are, um, is related to interventions that try to change sexual orientation. Mm -hmm. So by that very nature that people are debating this suggests that there's something wrong with people who are gay, lesbian, or bisexual if they need to be repaired. Mm -hmm. So I can talk a little bit more about that in, when we talk if whether or not sexual orientation can be changed. But I wanted to say that the debate, when, when we think it's over, it really isn't. So, Well, what causes people to have a particular sexual orientation? That's a good question, and again, one that we've studied for a long time. And the truth about that is we don't know. The simple answer is we don't know. Our best educated guess is it seems to be a combination of factors related to both biology, genetics, hormones, and the environment that people grow up in. So the old nature-nurture debate that we've studied for years in, in psychology about what causes anything is apropos to this discussion as well. Well, can sexual orientation be changed? Good question, and again, this leads us back to some of the um, debates that we've been having about reparative therapy. And let me just say that there are some people whose sexual orientation seems to naturally change. Their sexual orientation is a little more fluid. For example, at times in their lives, they're more attracted to men. At other times in their lives, they're more attracted to women. Mm -hmm. So that just seems to evolve naturally. And it, it, it could be that people whose sexual orientation is more fluid may be at their core bisexual, a uh, topic that's near and dear to us, of yeah. course. But what we've learned is that actual interventions, therapeutic interventions that try to change sexual orientation have not been substantiated by the solid scientific research on that topic. As a matter of fact, to the contrary, it has been suggested that some of those interventions actually cause psychological harm. And they cause harm because it, it, it sort of legitimizes the stigma of people that are gay, lesbian, and bi as there's something wrong with them. Yeah. So, What is the nature of same-sex relationships? Well, a lot of people <laughs> wonder about that. And I think one of the things that the psychological research has done on all the questions that you'll be asking me is to study some of the stereotypes. And in this case, I think people tend to think that, oh, gay, lesbian, bisexual people, a lot of their relationships focus on the sex. You know, mm -hmm. they must be having a lot of sex or it must be kind of interesting sex or maybe unhealthy sex. Yeah. But the truth of the matter is, is that gay, lesbian, and bisexual people and transgender people enter into intimate relationships for the same reasons that heterosexual people do. It's because we love people, we're committed, we have responsibilities, we have hopes and dreams, we want to raise children sometimes. So what the research has shown is that relationships between gay, lesbian, and bisexual people are very similar to those of heterosexual people. Good to know. Well, can gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender people, can they be good parents? Anita, the short answer to that is yes. Yeah. But because we won't have time to go into detail on that particular topic, I want to refer people to a publication put out by the American Psychological Association on lesbian and gay parenting. And that summarizes a lot of the research on this issue. So I would refer you to uh, APA.org, which is the website for the American Psychological Association, to get more in-depth answers to that. I would also refer you to the Minnesota Psychological Association website, MinPsych, M-N, 
PSYCH.org, and we have a position statement that also uh, will give you more information about the research on all these questions. So, so do children of lesbian, gay, bisexual uh, people have more problems with their sexual identity than do children of heterosexual parents? I think that, again, putting this in the context of stereotypes and beliefs and myths, there has been sort of a, a prevalent belief that if same-sex couples raise children, they're more likely to create more gay, lesbian, and bisexual kids, mm -hmm. or that the kids would be more disturbed. What we've learned is that the psychosexual development of children raised in same-sex couples or marriages are very similar to heterosexual kids, so that um, there doesn't seem to be much of a difference there. So some kids, no matter who their parents are, are going to have some, some issues with sexual identity, and some are going to have other sorts of social problems, but the prevalence is the same. Yes, as a matter of fact, what we have learned is that children who grow up in same-sex uh, couples, or their children of same-sex couples, tend to predominantly turn out as heterosexual. So, and just as heterosexual parents don't cause their children to be gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender, the same can be said of gay and lesbian and bisexual parents, that they're not likely to cause their, the sexual orientation of their children to be one way or the other. All right. Um, are children, this is, a, this is a sensitive question, are children who are raised by gay, uh, lesbian, or let's just say by same-sex parents, are they more likely to be abused by a parent or a parent's friend or a, an acquaintance? That's a good question. And again, I want to come back to some of the stereotypes and the myths. And there was a prevalent belief that um, gay men or bisexual men were more likely to be childhood children, they're more likely to molest children. Mm -hmm. And when we <clears throat> research that, um, same-sex couples or gay men or lesbians aren't any more likely than heterosexual people to molest children. And so these children are not any more likely to be at risk for being abused than children of heterosexual unions. I'm very glad to hear that. Um, what is the psychological impact of prejudice and discrimination? Another good question and apropos to this topic. There are a couple ways that I want to answer this. One is to talk about minority stress and the other is to talk about stigma. And as I indicated earlier, psychologists have been studying um, stereotypes and prejudice and discrimination for years. In the 1960s and 1950s, we were looking at uh, racial issues and the uh, stigma of those um, kinds of uh, issues related to psychological health. But more likely, these well, in addition, these days we're, we're talking about that in relate, relation to sexual orientation. So the issue of minority stress. Minority stress is a kind of stress that is above and beyond the average kind of stresses that people face, such as stress with their relationships, stress with their work, stress with raising children, financial stress, all of those kinds of things. And the minority stress piece of it has to do with stress based on some aspect of our identity that is marginalized or not valued by the dominant culture. And what we have learned in studies about minority stress is that people that experience it are more likely to have some psychological problems. They're more likely to have physical problems. Mm -hmm. They are uh, more likely to uh, just be dissatisfied with things in general. So it, it impairs and adversely affects people. In regard to discrimination, we can also talk about the concept of stigma. And stigma basically is an undesired difference based on some aspect of our identity. And that could be race, it could be sexual orientation, it could be disabilities. 
all of those kind of put us at a disadvantage in the dominant culture. And we know that people that are stigmatized, again, are more likely to experience the minority stress and to experience uh, more psychological uh, problems because of that. Mm -hmm. But again, I want to undermine that uh, gay, lesbian, and bi people, that is not the issue. The issue is the kinds of environmental stress that people experience because of being stigmatized. Mm -hmm. um, is there any research that has explored whether gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender people want to get married? Yes, there is, Anita. And, you know, just like heterosexual people, there are some gay, lesbian, and bi people that want to get married and some that don't. And, um, but what we have found in the research is that people who have chosen to get married, who are same-sex same couples, discover that there's a qualitative difference and some psychological benefits related to getting married. And just as an example, the state of California had legalized civil unions. And in 2008, when their Supreme Court overturned the ban on same-sex marriage, 18,000 couples chose to get married. Now, that's a lot. And this might also be a good time, Anita, to show some clips that we have of some of the guests that we've had on By Cities who have had the benefit of getting married. Well, we're, I think we're really fortunate that we're gonna, you're going to learn about two couples. Um, and the first person who's going to speak is Scott Dibble, who is a Minnesota senator from District 60. And he's going to talk about his experiences uh, having been in a domestic partnership and then getting married. And then our second clip is Robin Oaks, who is a, an author, uh, a speaker, and a bisexual activist. And Robin and her partner live in Boston. Well, this is a little bit of a personal question, but I've mm -hmm. talked to people that have um, been domestic partners mm -hmm. with their beloveds and maybe even had civil unions, and then they got to be married, and they said there really was a striking psychological difference in terms of how they felt. And mm -hmm. how was that for you? Did it, did it feel like something really special yes, and was, different uh, yes. compared to having lived together for a while or yeah, something? Yeah. No, and I'm, I'm happy to, to speak about my life, per speak about my life. And it's not about me, but it's about you know, the issues that we represent in this, in this point in history, and I, and I appreciate that. Just like you know, my friendship with my colleagues is not about me and them. It's about you know what difference we're, our names will be forgotten. Mm. Um, but it's about the difference we Your make. Your name for those, will never be forgotten, oh, Scott. I, let's uh, set the record I'm straight. Not <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm happy to talk about uh, because it helps illuminate and illustrate yes. what exactly we're doing. And uh, yeah, I, I, it actually surprised me the wedding, uh, the marriage, uh, you know that that public statement, and and you know you know and the language made a difference. And what surprised me was I have a great family, really wonderfully supportive family. They love Richard. He has a wonderful family. They love me. They could not have been more supportive through our meeting and our courtship and our, and our you know, and our, you know, we kind of married each other, uh -huh. you know, in the eyes of God. And, and they knew that and they knew that we were committed for life and, and they were very appreciative. But having gotten married legally in California, having had the wedding, gave them a point of access and a point of understanding of us that I didn't realize until we went through that, um, that, that wasn't, wasn't available to them, wasn't available to us until that moment. Um, you know, I'm getting kind of teared up and just, I mean, it's very emotional. Yeah. So it's, it's yeah, I'm very, very, very and that's okay, but, yeah. but it's powerful. And mm -hmm. people don't realize that I, uh, when we had some of the debates at the American Psychological Association last year, they have actually done research on states where civil unions are permitted versus marriages. And there is a difference, a qualitative difference that people are reporting mm -hmm. when they can actually get married. And it's mm -hmm. different than domestic partnerships. It's different than civil unions. And there's you enter, something powerful. You enter into a, a, a community, a point of contact, a point of access 
um, that I think lends uh, a stability and a, and a quality of support um, that that really isn't available otherwise. And so we talk. I, I am asked that question quite a bit. Well, this is just a, 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 a issue of language, and or you know you can create all of these uh, civil arrangements with an attorney through through a contract, et cetera, et cetera. First of all, that's just not true. Yes. You know you can't replicate what's available to you through marriage with attorneys and contracts or even civil unions. Separate is not equal in many practical respects. Yes. Um, not the least of which is it's a confused state from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, from state to state, and vis-a-vis -vis the federal government, et cetera. Plus there are a whole lot of statutes that, that are so specifically drawn to those who are married. Um, they're completely outside the reach of anything you can create with yourself uh, through a civil union or with inside your own relationship. Um, but that, that qualitative aspect that you touched on, that was a very insightful question, certainly is not available to you. It is separate, but equal is not equal. That's we correct. know that from, yes. the, from the civil rights debates of the Deep South of a, of a previous era. You have been married a month from today, May 17th, 2009. You will have been legally married for five years. Wow. And with your partner for 13 years. So That's right. Yeah. 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 What, what's that been like for you to, you know, really feel it's legal and... Well, aside from the fact that we caused the end of civilization in Massachusetts. Okay. All right. It's yeah. collapsed and okay. terrible Ted things Ted Kennedy got the brain tumor. Yeah. Huh? yeah, everything. We caused everything. Actually, the year that we got marriage equality, the Red Sox won the, the pennant. So oh, I think that that was... That was so I exciting. like that. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> reward instead of punishment, right? It was uh -huh. no, but it's been it's been wonderful. It's been really, really wonderful, and I think in Massachusetts it's really normalized now. It's not a big deal. Hmm. People are beyond that. Wow, most so it's people just are, have moved on. Well, you kind of. I think at first it was hard to imagine. So for a lot of people, there was resistance based on this unimaginable thing. But now it's happened, and it's no big deal. And people have seen that nothing really. That it's not really about them. Yeah, nobody it hasn't died affected their lives. No, nothing. You know, nothing like, you know, we got married, and the next day everyone still had to go to work, and the buses still ran, and the supermarkets still had food on the shelves, and and I think people just got used to it and and realized that it really wasn't such a big deal. Mm -hmm. What did it feel like for you personally? I mean, did it feel <laughs> different from being with your beloved for eight years and then suddenly, what was that like? Yeah, when personally? we first got married, I thought it wasn't going to be a big deal. I thought, oh, this is great. We'll have some legal rights, and isn't this a wonderful political thing that we'll be able to do this? But it really was. It really was a big deal in ways that I hadn't imagined or hadn't even thought about before. One of the things that was amazing was the affirmation that we received, the support and the excitement and the really powerful well wishes of all kinds of people around us the day we got married. The town clerk was excited to be marrying us. He was delighted and thrilled. Um, our next door neighbor hugged us when we got home oh. and said, it's about time, I'm so happy for you. Um, oh. Our straight neighbors were celebrating and supporting us. Our LGBT neighbors were there for us. Um, I had a stranger run up to us the day we got married. A stranger ran up to us that morning and like thrust a bouquet of flowers in my arms and then ran off. Wow. She just said, congratulations, here, oh. and she ran off. We had um, children were waving from school buses, oh and honk, like the gosh. school bus driver was honking the oh, horn, and, and people yeah. were like on public buses. People were waving, and cars were tooting their horns. And on the way home, oh one of the one of my favorite moments was we were stopped at a light on the way home, and we were actually in a motorcycle with a sidecar, and with tin cans. Oh. Hanging off the back of the cat food cans, actually. Cat food cans. Hanging off the back of the thing and a just married sign on the back. And we were stopped at a light, and this street artist ran out into the street and handed me a painting and said, Here, let this be your first wedding gift. Oh my God. And I was sitting there. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> and he ran off. Wow. And like, that whole day, and I, think, I don't think that most people in same sex relationships expect that kind of affirmation. Yes. We don't expect to be celebrated. We expect usually at best to be tolerated and to be celebrated and to be truly celebrated mm -hmm. was something that I had never imagined would happen in my life. Wow. And it was awesome. It was yeah. really nice. 
it, it felt so good. And, and I've talked to a lot of my other friends who got married as well, and they felt the same way. So it was so much bigger than legal rights. Yes, it was, it was yes. about being celebrated by your community yeah. and being recognized by your community. That's very powerful. It is. Yeah. Well, you know, Anita, every time I look at those clips, I just get goosebumps. I don't know about you, but I think their stories tell yeah. what it's like and how people feel when really? they have the benefit of being able to experience marriage. So they perhaps said it all and better than even the psychological research. So, well, I, I just want to thank you very much for uh, answering these questions today. And I'm, I know you're proud, but as, as kind of, you know, one half of, of the hosts of Bi Cities, for us to partner with the Minnesota Psychological Association. This is something that I'm just very proud to have done. So I want to thank you and the association, all of the members, for the incredible decades of research that have shed light on the, uh, the relevance of marriage equality being offered to all people, regardless of sexual orientation. Well, it's always a pleasure to do this kind of work with you, and I, too, am proud that we can be part of a joint venture mm -hmm. to do this work. So thank you. Thank, thank you, you to everybody. Thank you for tuning in, and we hope that this program has helped you to better understand the scientific research underlying the Minnesota Psychological Association's stance on marriage equality.